Now, if you will please turn your Bible with me to Romans chapter 5, if you have it before you. We are going to be thinking particularly about the verses right in the middle of that passage, which was read to us earlier. And I want us to read them again and then to bow together in prayer. From verse 6 of Romans 5, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that as you are our teacher, and have sent your Holy Spirit into our hearts to instruct us in your truth. We pray that he who is the author of your written word may also make it the living word of God in our midst and in our lives this morning. For Jesus' sake. Amen. You may have noticed that on this Remembrance Sunday, and it will be true all over the United Kingdom this morning, there is a kind of vocabulary that gathers around these Remembrance occasions. And the vocabulary contains words like sacrifice and death and freedom and love, and remembrance, and gratitude. It is the kind of language which, of course, is part of biblical religion. And wherever you look in Scripture, you find that that sort of vocabulary is employed again and again to describe the very essence of the biblical gospel. And that, I imagine, is why you find more than once in Scripture that the thing that we are remembering as a nation this morning, that is, the incredible nature of many instances of human sacrifice, is used to help us in some small measure, to grasp even a little of that most glorious and original love which God has poured out upon us in Jesus Christ. Jesus, for example, himself in John 15 helps his disciples to understand something of his going from them and his sacrifice on the cross when he says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. And here in this passage that we read this morning, in Romans 5 from verse 6, Paul is using the example of human sacrifice to help our understanding of the nature and quality of God's love for us. And he does so mainly by contrast. Do you notice in verse 7 of the passage, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, says Paul. Such sacrifice is rare, but it is not unknown. For a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates or commends his love to us. In this, while we were still 
sinners, Christ died for us. Now, it is a good thing for us to remember and not forget the love and sacrifice that was shown for us all down through our history in the century by other people. But what we discover again and again on Remembrance Sundays and on occasions like this and on national days of thanksgiving is that we discover that whatever man has done, whatever we may see in the love of man for his fellows, it has left the world in this parlous, desperate state in which it is in today. There is no anchor for our life personally or nationally in that whole realm. And so it is important for us to follow the path that Scripture leads us whenever it speaks to us of the love of man for his fellows, even if it comes to the point of self-sacrifice, it takes us on into the love of God, which is the only anchor for our souls and the only hope of our nation. Now, I want us to try to learn something about this amazing love of God of which Paul is speaking to us so simply and yet so profoundly in these verses. Its absolute uniqueness, he tells us, lies in two things. And these are the two main things that I want to think with you about this morning. First, its objects. That is, its recipients. The people on whom the love of God is bestowed. That's the first thing that amazes the apostle. And the second is its expression. What God has done as the expression of his love for us, which makes it altogether overwhelming and amazing. Now, there is no question in my mind that Scarcely any of us as Christian people wonder enough at the love of God. Scarcely any of us have found our souls as amazed as they ought to be, as transported into another dimension altogether by the astonishing love of God for us in Jesus Christ. And Paul is seeking to help us in this realm as we turn to these verses this morning. It is true that though we sing it, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? The truth is that we all too often find ourselves regarding it as perfectly normal. As the French proverb puts it, God will forgive, that is his business. And when people say, well, of course, I always thought that God was a God of love, it is as though it were something that is not astounding and amazing and baffling. And I rather think that we can tell far more about ourselves by asking how much Am I amazed by the love of God? How truly do I sing with Wesley? Amazing love. How can it be? Well, the line along which Paul helps us is, first of all, by concentrating our attention on the objects of God's love. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. Now, what he is referring to is that one of the great characteristics of human love, as we all of us know from our own experience and from our own hearts, is that almost always it has its origin in its object, or at least it is stimulated 
by it. That is, it is aroused by something good or attractive in someone or even someone who has become sad or pathetic, that arouses our love. But our love so often is aroused and originates or at least is stimulated by its object. Now, Paul says, the greatest contrast between divine love and human love is precisely here. Look at verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love, his unique love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what he does is to lay emphasis on the condition that we were in when God's love touched us. Let me just unfold a little what the apostle tells us in these few verses about the objects of God's love, upon whom God's love focuses and is bestowed. There are really four descriptions that he gives us which you can follow very easily in your Bible. First of all, in verse 6, he says, those whom God bestowed his love upon were the powerless or the helpless. The beginning of verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died. Now, of course, helplessness, which is really the meaning of the word by itself, might excite the divine pity, as we would expect, were it not that Paul goes on to tell us what lies behind this helplessness. It is not an attractive helplessness like the helplessness of a baby, or an invalid, or a cripple, the kind of helplessness that draws out love from us. This is something altogether different. It is a helplessness that derives from ungodliness. Look to the end of verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, that's the second thing that Paul tells us in his description of those for whom Christ died. This helplessness in which God found us is brought about by ungodliness, that is, by dismissing God from life, by refusing to give him the honor which belongs to him, by rebelling against him in independence and pride. So this helplessness has as its nature a proud defiance of God. It is not the pathetic condition of somebody who acknowledges their helplessness and powerlessness to do anything about their condition. Quite the reverse. It is a proud defiance of God, which the New Testament calls ungodliness. And this is his real state as God comes in this infinite love that he has in Jesus Christ. To us. Man, helpless because he has refused to have God in all his thoughts and lived as though God did not exist. And that has left him helpless to do anything about his most serious condition. And these are the people on whom God has poured out his love. But there is a third description of those who are the objects of God's love. They are not only helpless and ungodly. They are in the third place, do you notice, sinners. In verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, do you see how Paul is developing this picture? Not only is man in his own nature utterly helpless and powerless because he is godless, but he has also been defiled and debased and destroyed by his sin. So not only is there a helplessness resulting from defiance of God, there is also an ugliness about man in his true condition which results from trampling down God's law and refusing to be subject to it. For that's what sin is. And that has spoiled, it has infected man's life. It is like one huge sore that is suppurating. And in the eyes of God, he is a helpless, godless sinner. And God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, what makes that so astonishing is this. If you had read your Bible right through until you came to this point, you would find that the great characteristic of God in relation to sin is that he hates it. That's one of the great characteristics of God. He hates it so much that he is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. He cannot look upon sin. Now, that puts a different complexion on the situation, does it not? The God of the Bible is a God whose whole being rises up in hatred against sin. It is his ultimate enemy. And how can it be then that the God who looks upon man helpless and godless and utterly defiled and destroyed by sin, pours out his love upon him. That's the amazing thing. What is abhorrent to God above all other things, he makes this amazing sacrifice for such people as those who are helpless, godless, and worthless. But there's one more thing. In verse 10, Paul tells us that the description cannot really be completed without this. If, he says, When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He says, do you realize what man's real condition is, therefore? He is helpless, powerless to save himself or to alter one iota of his deepest problem. He is godless because he has defied God and lived without him. He is Worthless because of his sinfulness and defilement upon which God cannot bear to look. But more than that, he says, he is God's enemy. Now, it might be conceivable, as Paul is acknowledging, that someone would bestow such costly sacrificial love on friends or even to stretch credulity upon well-disposed strangers, but to do so for a bitter enemy is quite astonishing. Ah, but someone might say to you, you know, you really have got it wrong, because I do not feel that I'm God's enemy. As a matter of fact, if I honestly look into my own heart, I don't find any enmity towards God there. 
Do you notice that's not what Paul is saying? He's not saying the amazing thing is that while we felt enmity towards God, Christ died for us. What he is saying is while we were God's enemies, that is, God views us as his enemies. And it is in the face of that that he sent his son. It is his enemies that he has loved. It's not a question of our feelings. It is a question of who we really are. And the Bible says, we were God's enemies when Christ died for us. And that's the position that we really are in, whether we feel it or recognize it or not. Because of what we are in our sin, we are at enmity with God. We are in a state of rebellion by nature against him. And Paul says, If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, then there is nothing that is not possible for God. Now let's turn to the other side of this picture. The amazing thing is that there is an expression of God's love which defies our fathoming or understanding. And because we have seen a little of who are its objects, we shall be the more amazed when we discover what is the expression of it. It is chiefly expressed in this, says Paul, and you get the two words in verse 6, Christ died. The place where God's love is primarily expressed in the universe is in the death of his Son. So what he has done for us is to sacrifice his dearest possession. Later on in Romans, Paul tells us, God did not spare him. He delivered him up for us all. And what he is saying is that here was God's choicest possession through all eternity, his only begotten son, the son of his love. And when the whole question of how much he was going to love helpless, hopeless sinners sitting in their defilement and helpless, he took the son of his love and he did not spare him, but he delivered him up on the cross for us. And that's the second note you will notice again and again. It is because he died for us. That is, in our place, he took all that we were upon himself. He bore all that we were as sinners. It was for us. Notice how frequently he says this. Christ died for the ungodly and the significance is in the place of the ungodly. The end of verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood. Verse 10, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Now, do you see what Paul is saying? This death of Jesus Christ on the cross expresses the love of God to us, not just because of what God gave up, but because of what Christ took on himself. That's the key to the love of God. Therefore, my dear friends, when people think lightly of sin, when they have a casual view of what it means to be a sinner, we will never begin to fathom the love of God in the death of Jesus. 
We need to grasp on the one hand what it was that God gave up the son of his bosom, his only begotten, and he did not withhold from him anything of the judgment that sin was to bear, but Christ took upon him. He took upon him our nature. He entered into all our human weakness. He entered into all that our sin had done to us and bore the penalty of it. But infinitely more than that, there is something else that Paul tells us. Did you notice it in our reading in verse 9? What we have been saved from by the love of God in the death of Jesus, what we have been saved from is not just the penalty of sin and its judgment, not just the guilt of sin and its defilement. But you notice what Paul says, since we have now been justified, verse 9, by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? You see, ultimately, what makes me an enemy of God is not my own feelings. It's not that I'm ill disposed to God or stand back and say I hate him. What makes me an enemy of God is the wrath of a holy God against sin. That's what makes me God's enemy. And the ultimate seriousness of sin is not what it does to me, nor what it does to other people, but what it does to God. It brings down his holy wrath. Now, where do you see the wrath of God most clearly? Where it is, is it expended most visibly in the universe? You think at the end of time, the days which the book of Revelation describe, well, none of us really knows what that will be like. But I tell you where the wrath of God has been expended most vividly in the universe to this day, and that is at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because what he was bearing was that very wrath and judgment of a holy God upon sin. And the love of God is nowhere more clearly seen than precisely there. We shall be saved from God's wrath through him. Can you imagine anything more extraordinary than that within the Godhead, for those who are helpless, godless, worthless enemies of God, there is this design and plan that God has in his heart from all eternity, and which comes to its climax in Gethsemane when Jesus cries out, to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And that cup was the cup of God's holy judgment upon sin. And then on Calvary he drinks it and cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the deep deep love of Jesus. It is not a sentimental love, 
but it is a love that should make us stand breathless with amazement, crying out to God, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That, you see, is what the love of God did to Paul. Somebody has said that his whole theology could be summarized in two phrases. One, Christian salvation is all grace. Two, Christian living is all gratitude. If you've grasped even the edges of the love of God like that, you will never be the same person again, ever. Let's pray together. Father, we cannot begin to fathom that you should have set your love upon us in Jesus Christ. And yet we come to you this morning acknowledging that we only love you because you have first loved us with such a burning, pure, and holy love. We thank you that it is not a love that waits until we are worthy. We thank you that it is not a love that is is even aroused because there is something attractive in us. We bless you that you loved us from the first of time. And you'll love us to the last Bathe our souls in that love this morning for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.